Here are the three biggest modern groups within Judaism, and we're focusing on the groups in North America. And we have to keep in mind that these are separated more by practice than they are separated by beliefs. Orthodox Jews are focused on being true to the laws of the Bible and the Talmud. They're focused on living by Torah in all areas. Thus, they keep the Sabbath, they only eat kosher food, they separate the sexes in the synagogue, both sexes cover their heads for worship, and they have traditional Saturday morning services at a synagogue. The second group at the other extreme is called Reform Judaism. And this is a modernized movement. Reform Judaism omits many traditional requirements and weakens others. They meet not in synagogues but in temples. They have Friday night services with the sexes sitting mixed together. There's an obvious Protestant influence on how they do things. Reform Judaism only arose in around the first half of the 1800s, with some roots in the late 1700s. For a statement of their interpretation of Judaism, you can look at the 1885 Pittsburgh Platform. Rather than law-keeping, they view ethics and social action as the essence of Judaism. The third group is conservative Jews. They are more like the Orthodox than like the Reform. They kind of aim to be a happy middle. They do try to keep the law to some extent, but they're modern as to clothes and as to their style of religious services. They're more open to what's called critical biblical scholarship. These are not the only divisions of modern Judaism, but these are the three biggest ones. Here's how American Jews report which group they belong to as of 2013. 30% don't profess any denomination. Very likely a lot of those would be secular Jews who would say that they're atheist or agnostic. Some 35% claim Reform Judaism, 18% conservative, 10% orthodox. Orthodox and conservative Jews find this chart a bit alarming because in recent years, younger generations have skewed more towards Reform Judaism, which is less traditional. Let's consider traditional Jewish doctrines then. One point to make is that in Judaism, practice is more important than belief. What matters most is belonging to a Jewish community and as part of that community, participating in their festivals, in their distinctive practices, Jews are less likely than Christians to get bent out of shape about the fine points of doctrine. Still, over the centuries, there is a sort of mainstream theological consensus within Judaism, and that's what we're going to talk about now. We'll do this by looking at a famous 13-point creed that was compiled by Moses Maimonides, the greatest Jewish scholar in the Middle Ages, also referred to by the nickname Rambam. The first point is belief in the existence of the Creator, who is perfect in every manner of existence and is the primary cause of all that exists. Second, the belief in God's absolute and unparalleled unity. Two comments about this. First, you'll notice the, how they write the word God. In modern times, Jews don't write out the word God in English. They put a dash for the letter O. This is considered a practice of respect. They're so respectful of God's name that they don't want to completely write it out. In previous lectures, I mentioned that God's proper name in the Jewish Bible is Yahweh, also sometimes transliterated as Jehovah. That's true, but for a very long time, and even back in the time of Jesus, Jews decided that they wouldn't say that. In many contexts, Jews prefer to refer indirectly to God through expressions like the name or the infinite. The Shema prayer says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The unity of God expressed here is understood to rule out polytheism, that there are many gods, but it's also understood to rule out the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Not only is God one God, but God has no inner distinctions, no differences within him, such as to rule out there being three persons in one God, as mainstream Christianity came to hold by around the year 400. Moving on, Maimonides cites belief in God's non-corporality, that God is not corporeal, that is not a body, not physical, not material, nor that he will be affected by any physical occurrences such as movement or rest or dwelling, or belief in God's eternity, five, the imperative to worship God exclusively and no foreign false gods, six, the belief that God communicates with man through prophecy, seven, the belief in the primacy of the prophecy of Moses, our teacher, eight, the belief in the divine origin of the Torah, that is the law, 
all of divine revelation, and specifically the first five books of the Jewish Bible. Nine, the belief in the immutability of the Torah. Ten, the belief in God's omniscience and providence. In other words, that God is all-knowing and that God is in control of what occurs. That's providence. Eleven, the belief in divine reward and retribution. Twelve, the belief in the arrival of the Messiah and the Messianic era. And thirteen, the belief in the resurrection of the dead. A few additional points about God and Jewish theology. One is that God is incomprehensible. He says in Exodus 3, I am what I am. Mainstream Jewish theology holds that God is too great to be understood. And also, God is too great to be represented by any idol. Remember that in the Ten Commandments, which we looked at before, idolatry is forbidden. The mainstream tradition of Judaism is aniconic. It's against the use of images in religious worship. We aren't necessarily against the making and use of any kind of images for any reason. There is Jewish art that portrays people like Abraham and Moses, but they don't bow to images, light candles in front of images, pray before images, and things like that. Both the Jewish Bible and the Talmud forbids any kind of idolatry. God in Jewish thinking is both imminent and transcendent. That is, God's existence is present everywhere. You can in some way learn about God by observing nature. God is present in the whole natural world. He's not just far away out there somewhere. And yet he's transcendent. That is, he's beyond the physical world. God isn't the physical world. He isn't just the cosmos. The cosmos isn't his body or really anything he needs. He is beyond it. It is his handiwork, even though he is present within it. One final point to make is that in the view of mainstream Judaism, our knowledge of God is not based on speculation or philosophical argument, but rather on real interaction with God. Their view is that God has revealed himself to humankind, that God has befriended Abraham and has, as he promised, favored and interacted with the descendants of Abraham. And it's on the basis of that revelation through a series of prophets that mainstream Judaism says that human beings can have knowledge of the one true God. What does Judaism teach about human beings? Judaism teaches that human beings have free will, so we are capable of doing both good and evil. They deny the doctrine of original sin, that in some way we are all responsible for Adam's sin, and in some sense that was our sin too. This is found in different Augustinian kinds of Christianity, such as Reformed Christianity. That doctrine of original sin they disagree with. We're responsible only for our own sins and not for anyone else's, so we're not responsible for the first human being's sin. Mainstream Judaism views human beings as a combination of body and spirit, or body and soul, Thus, when we die, even though our body ceases to exist, there is something left over, the spirit. Human beings have a unique worth and dignity because they're made, Genesis says, quote, in God's image and likeness, end quote. Humans are like God. Conversely, then, God must be, in some ways, like a human. Humans are special among the creatures that roam the face of the earth in having this kind of worth and dignity. This is a key point that makes the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam different than other religions. You could say that they have a high view about human beings and human nature. To be a human is to be a very important thing, a wonderful and valuable thing. We're not merely a hairless biped, not merely the dominant species on the earth. And according to Genesis, we all come from one ancestor, we all come from Adam and the first woman Eve, and thus we're all one race, we're all really one lineage, and so we're all equal. A key concept in the Jewish view about God and humankind is the idea of a covenant. Covenant is basically a contract, but in ancient cultures, a covenant was imposed by a stronger party on the weaker party. So, for instance, a conquering king would impose a covenant on a conquered people. Like a modern-day contract, there would be obligations that both sides would have to uphold and duties that both sides would have to uphold as a part of the deal. Generally, the stronger would promise protection in return for the obedience of the weaker. As we saw in our first lecture on Judaism, according to the book of Genesis, God made a covenant with Abraham and with all the descendants of Abraham. He promised that they would be his special people, that he would bless the world through them, 
but they were obligated to keep his ways and to be faithful to him alone. And so far as they're faithful to him, they have a special blessing and a special place with God. Not that they're intrinsically more valuable than other people's. Seemingly, they've just been chosen because of God's friendship with Abraham, because Abraham had faith in God and trusted God. And yet, if they turn away from God, then that releases him from his obligation to bless them. That's the special covenant that defines the relationship of the Jews to the one God. But it's not the only covenant. Rabbinic Judaism teaches that there is another covenant which applies to non-Jews. They call it the Noahide Covenant. It's based on their interpretation of Genesis. It has only the following elements. The positive injunction to set up courts that justly enforce social laws. The prohibition of blasphemy, that is, intolerance of worshiping the one God. The prohibition of idolatry, prohibitions of grave sexual immorality, such as incest and adultery, prohibition of murder, prohibition of theft, prohibition of eating the limb of a live animal, which is a paradigm example of cruelty. If you're not a Jew and you keep this deal, you will have favor with God. The Jews have a special deal, but they also have to live up to a much higher standard. The Jewish law has been counted up to contain 613 commandments and prohibitions, The Noahide Covenant has a listed seven. This is the deal, then, that Rabbinic Judaism teaches that God has made for the Gentiles. Gentiles means the peoples, the other peoples. This is the covenant for the Gentiles. In our next and last segment, the Messianic Age, and also some texts from the books of Isaiah and 2 Kings.